Um, hi, so it is my great pleasure indeed to announce that the speaker in today's seminar is going to be Martin van Dijk. Uh, Martin is a professor at the University of Connecticut um, and also since many years actually a research affiliate at MIT. Um, at MIT, Martin was also part of the team that introduced the then novel concept of a physical unclone with functional PUF, making him actually one of the early ancestors or early forefathers of PUF research. Now, <coughs> today Martin is not going to talk about PUFs, but about a different topic. He's going to deal with... <laughs> He's going to deal with a theme that is more recent in his own research portfolio, uh, namely hardware trojans, and in particular hardware trojan countermeasures. The exact title of his talk, as you can see on the first slide, being Hatch, Advancing the State of the Art in Hardware Trojan Detection. Now, Martin, I guess it's needless to say that we are all very delighted about your visit. Thanks for coming. The stage is yours. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the invitation. So I'm happy to be here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, heart heartthrone detection and also uh, heart heartthrone design a little bit. So this is uh, joint work with uh, my students. As you can see, I've put uh, Kamran in bold, as you know, as students, most of you, uh, you're doing most of the work for those projects. And I'd like to make sure that Kamran gets the credits here. So this is uh, joint work with also a colleague of mine, Omar, with his student, Masab, Sheng Lu and Kamran are students of mine and Dave Fu from UTRC. So this talk is going to be about um, heart heterogens. Uh, let me first explain what they are, so for those who may not know this, and then introduce the problem statement that we're going to consider. So what we'll be doing is uh, talking about what we call uh, pre-silicon uh, detection mechanisms of trojans. And uh, the goal of this talk is to actually create uh, a framework, a rigorous framework that allows you to uh, classify uh, exponentially large classes of hardware trojans given by certain specific parameters, uh, some advanced properties. And I will explain those. And within such a class, uh, you can then prove that, uh, say, uh, Hatch, in this case, the detection tool that we're going to talk about, has certain nice properties. So we can show that uh, if you want to detect uh, all the trojans within a certain uh, uh, class, exponentially large class, defined by a certain selection of certain parameters, then, uh, well, if you select, if you input the right parameters for Hatch, then you'll be able to detect all the hardware trojans within that ex exponentially large class with negligible false negatives, meaning that you will really detect almost all the hardware trojans in that class. And at the same time, you would also want to make sure that your algorithm is uh, relatively uh, efficient. We will come to that. Uh, why do I say relative? You can think of it as being polynomial in one way, but that in itself explodes as well. And um, uh, and you would also want the false positives, meaning that uh, if I'm ha having this detection tool and I'm going to uh, use it on uh, unaffected, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 pre-silicon, uh, you know, net list or whatever it is, then, you know, I do not want to uh, modify this in the way that Hatch is doing it in such a way that in the end it will detect a heart withdrawing while it's actually normal and it, it, does not, it's, it was not affected by a heart withdrawing. So you want to eliminate false positives. And this is actually a really big problem with certain uh, state-of-the-art uh, detection tools. So we want to control this, and that's <coughs> possible. And we can prove some nice theorem about it. But of course, uh, subject to certain statistical assumptions that you have to believe in. And, and we'll shortly talk about that. So this is what the talk roughly will be about. And uh, so let me start with some background. So what's a hardware throw-in? So first of all, um, you know, generally, and I think everybody knows about this, it's a malicious piece of logic embedded into a larger circuit. And what do you want to do? You want to try as an adversary to, for example, leak uh, sensitive data from that larger circuitry to the adversary, maybe using some trapdoor or what. And um, or you would like to harm the normal functionality. That's another option. So um, hardware trojans are coming in uh, two major classes. One is those that are trigger activated, meaning that uh, uh, you will uh, input uh, uh, a certain um, you know, uh, trapdoor uh, kind of input that then will activate the hardware trojan 
and as a result it will deliver a payload, for example, uh, leaking some information. Others can be always active, uh, for example, they always drain the battery, for example, things like that. So there are several possible payloads, denial of service, leakage of sensitive information, etc., reducing battery life, but also important is to understand that you could weaken security mechanisms that are built into, into the larger circuitry, and you would like to, for example, bypass protection against, dif against differential power analysis or things like that. So a bunch of examples here are taken from uh, two papers that unfortunately you cannot really see, but if you look at the slides later on, maybe you, 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 um, you'll be able to look that up. This is just an overview just to show you uh, the huge landscape that we can think of. So take, for example, the trigger-activated ones. Well, what's the trigger? <coughs> well, first of all, the action that can be taken is a certain specific input, for example. Um, it, uh, it, it, the, 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 the one who is given that input can be the legitimate user, even. It can be the attacker. Uh, the, 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 the way, um, uh, for example, um, um, information is leaked could even be over, of course, over the I.O. pins and the keyboards and so forth. That, that can be used for input, but the output can be over the LCD screen or even LEDs. Those are legitimate outputs also. If you have a, a microcontroller that is uh, steering a whole bunch of peripherals, then you have some embedded system and the LCD Le uh, uh, the LEDs themselves can create some kind of pattern that could leak some information. So everything is possible and you see a wide vari variety of possible hardware drones that have been classified over the time. An important class is the ones that try to use side channels, uh, so for example electromagnetic uh, waves, etc., etc. And in our classification we will see that we're going to distinguish two types of hardware drones one that we call de deterministic, and the other ones that we call non-deterministic. The non-deterministic ones uh, will use, uh, uh, for example, side channels and so on. I will explain that later. And uh, we will not be able to give hardcore guarantees in our framework about those. We will be restricting ourselves to deterministic hardware drones, and those are the ones for which, first of all, the functional specification of, say, the IP core is um, is actually uh, deterministic in the sense that it's not, for example, a lossy compression uh, scheme that is implemented. So you accept outputs uh, that uh, uh, that that can have some variation in themselves. So, in other words, you always want to have a real function that is being computed. For example, an AES encryption scheme. You know that if you give it a plain text, you get a certain ciphertext. It's always exactly that same ciphertext that you will get as an output. But if I do, say, my decompression or, 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 or compression in, in a lossy way, for example, then there will be some uh, variation. And you do not really know uh, how to test that from a functional spec specification point of view. And, um, and also, in a deterministic way, we would not like to use, for example, uh, true random number generators that have uh, a, 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 a real uh, influence on the computation of your circuitry. And why is that? Because through random number generators, and I heard from Uli that some of you in the Christoph Parr groups uh, have, have, have been working on, on, on random number generators, but then you know that that means that uh, you could potentially uh, 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 ferry or replace the, the true random number generator by a Trojan, which is, say, a pseudo random number generator that is indistinguishable from the outside, from, from, say, the true randomness that ought to be generated, but effectively you've created uh, a trapdoor because you know the seed as, our, uh, as an adversary and then you can do all kinds of bad things. So what we want is true deterministic functionality in that for the IP core that we would like to detect hardware drawings for. So we'll go in much more detail later on. But that's just to give you a little bit of a background because what is the problem setting that we're talking about here? So, well, let me first talk about an FPGA design flow for people who do not maybe know about this. What you often have is you have some functional specification and then you will uh, start to create some, uh, so, some, some net list. I will skip a lot of this text. But uh, the net list, I'll write it over here. Actually, is this also pointing? Uh, oh yeah. 
Uh, no. Oh, wait, I have to turn that off. Oh, actually, it does not work at all anymore. Oh, wait a minute, can you call one back? So, oh, okay, great. So yeah, for the FPGA design flow, it's some, ouch. <laughs> I have to practice. So, um, so for the NGC netlist that's being produced over there, uh, this is actually being provided to a customer who buys the IP core and he can then, or he or she can then use that in its own product. Uh, you would like to buy IP cores because it can be included in a larger design that you want to create and that will make your, uh, and, and, and that, will be cost uh, 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 that will be cost effective in your business model. But that means that um, uh, the rest of the tool chain is really in control of the customer and we come to make use of that. So our setting is that you get a net list and you do not really know whether the net list has something bad in itself. So we assume a closed IP core. That means that you have access to this net list, but you do not really know what the higher level um, um, uh, a code looks like. So you do not really know how this circuit is exactly implemented. Actually, the one who is manufacturing or creating the IP core wants to uh, prevent you as a buyer from understanding all these implementation tricks that it has used. And it, it's sort of a, a protecting of the intellectual property of that product that it tries to sell to you, that IP core. So now you do have access to this netlist, but it's very hard to go back and find out what that higher level code really is. Because if you could, then clearly you could also figure out whether it maybe has some uh, suspicious code at the higher level that represents uh, a, um, a Trojan. All right, so, so um, um, the hardware Trojans that we're considering here can be embedded in this IP core and are present in this netlist. So what can we do? So on one hand, uh, the one who is trying to detect hardware Trojans in the pre-silicon phase, that's how we think about it before this is being um, mapped onto the FPGA itself, programmed onto the FPGA itself, you have access to the functional specification at a higher level and at the same time you have access to... Hey. Oh, oh, there it is. Uh, you have access to the netlist. And this netlist can be used to emulate uh, the working of the IP core. And that's what we're going to use. We're going to see that by emulating the IP core, you can potentially, uh, first of all, you can figure out whether the functional spec is violated or not. And secondly, you will be able to figure out through emulation which wires, which sets of wires are being used within that whole IP core. And through that, you then will be able to create uh, uh, an additional layer of circuitry that you will embed uh, 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 around this netlist. You will add extra wire, so to speak, uh, that will be able to trigger um, suspicious events later on. Uh, we'll talk about that much later uh, in, 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 in the coming uh, slides. So I'll slowly try to, and you can interrupt me any time, by the way, if you have questions, right? It's very important. So in this talk, we really focus on the ASIC design flow, where, uh, again, it's the same kind of ID uh, that I just described. So now we have RTL, that is a synthesized netlist of the IP core, which is provided to the customer. And again, the hardware trojans can be embedded in this. And you would like to find out whether there's a hardware trojan in it. So how can you detect this? So that's truly the pre-silicon uh, detection mechanisms that we're talking about here. So what are these design flow vulnerabilities? So we have the spec that we trust, but unfortunately, uh, you know, there's untrusted uh, code uh, like the higher level code embeds actually this, I, this hardware throw-in and that has been translated into that netlist that we're talking about. Secondly, the process of creating that netlist by the one who is selling the IP core uh, uses some kind of a compiler and uh, you know you should only trust those that uh, are well known, for example those, but it could be possible that IP core provider may not use it, it may not use those types of trustworthy tools. And if you're looking at this uh, really fabulous paper, I don't know whether you have studied this, Reflections on Trusting Trust by Ken Thompson, amazing paper, 
that explains that if your compiler is not trustworthy, then effectively whatever you compile, um, uh, whatever code you are compiling may create a, uh, um, a bit file that actually uh, contains some kind of a Trojan or, or some software Trojan in, in this paper. So I would recommend reading this paper, it's a really good one. Um, so these are the design flow vulnerabilities. So now let's go to the problem statement. And the problem statement is that we realize, first of all, that IP cores are heavily used. And uh, the reason is uh, that, uh, uh, and, and, and are bought by other, uh, and, and, and are bought from other parties. And the reason is that uh, you do not want to redo the same work. It's much more cost effective to just buy it from someone else. But unfortunately, those are vulnerable to hardware trillions. So what's the state of the art? So first of all, we realize that any hardware, uh, any detection scheme that is being developed can be defeated again by new sophisticated hardware trillions. We want to understand what needs to be new about such a hardware trillion to defeat this particular tool. So we would like to create a formal framework that explains, uh, first of all, for the current tool at hand, the exact characterization of the hardware trillions that it can detect. And then you also know that a designer, a hardware trillion designer, will need to step out of this class in order to circumvent the detection tool. Secondly, you would like to understand uh, the computational complexity of your tool with respect to that hardware trillion class. And uh, currently, um, you know, all these detection tools have invisible high computational complexity. I'm not saying that we're going to completely solve this problem here. Um, um, from an asymptotics point of view, you could on one hand say, sure, we do a, a reasonable job. On the other hand, we will show, we will see that um, uh, we will have a polynomial complexity where the degree of the polynomial is in itself a property of a hardware trillion. So clearly, if you can design hardware trillions that make the degree of the polynomial very, very large, then you will not be able to use our tool as well because it's infeasible to run. So, where are we? So we have two central questions that we want to answer. First, which exponentially large class of hardware trillions can uh, be detected by, 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 by a tool? So we're talking about our tool here with negligible false negative rate. And secondly, we would like to design a tool that is uh, uh, efficient and with and has controlled false positive rate. So you would really want to be able to say something about uh, the amount of false positives that will occur. Now this is very important because uh, current state-of-the-art schemes um, often have very high false positive rates. So we can uh, parameterize the false positive rate in our tool, but, uh, 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 but the proof that we have uh, assumes a certain set of assumptions and you will need to believe in those, of course. Yeah, go for it. I'm a little overwhelmed by too many words, I don't understand. Yeah, yeah I can. Um, yeah. So, um, so, what is the, so what is given to your tool? What's the input to your tool? And this output is clear. No, output is yeah. yes or no. It's very hard to put it in. No, what's the input to your tool? Yeah, so the input to our tool is this. So first of all, you have a functional specification. So you have that. All this. All this, what is it? Uh, like, uh, for example, I know that the IP core compute computes an AES encryption. So the functional spec is just the fact that it obeys that standard that is known in, in, in public. Then I get, in addition, I get, uh, uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, RTL uh, synthesized netlist over here. And uh, this is effectively uh, the implementation of how this manufacturer has created this AES encryption tool, uh, uh, IP core for you. Now, uh, what you get is this netlist, and you still want to um, translate this netlist all the way to, in the end, uh, to uh, uh, a bitmap, to a physical implementation, and then into uh, uh, actual uh, silicon. So what do you get? You get a specification. It's a pure functional specification. And also, you get a, a, a piece of code which uh, implements, supposedly, that particular AES encryption scheme. But it could include a hardware trillion. So those are the two inputs to the tool. And then another set of inputs is related to what kind of hardware trillions do you plan to detect. So I'm going to talk about the class of hardware trillions that are 
um, characterized by what we call dimension and a couple of other properties. And then I can set, say, well, I like to use this tool for dimension three hardware trillions with uh, latency uh, five and with whatever. And then I have characterized exactly the hardware trillions that I have tried to detect. So that is effectively what one does. And then you know that you will not be, you have no guarantees about hardware trillions that go beyond those parameters that have a higher dimension or something else. But what you do know is that you really are able to now detect with false, with negligible false negative rates, the trones within the class that you run the hedge tool for. And you can also set the false positive rate. So in these types of tools, you have these two important parameters, well, actually three. You have the computational complexity, obviously. Uh, that is just, uh, you know, um, uh, you hope to get a good tool. Um, and, but uh, the two parameters that you would really like to control are the false negatives and the false positives. So in any of these manufacturing processes, there is a possibility that the Trojan is inserted, right? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. But you are so interested, I mean, the end, we are interested in the output, no? In the end, we have the yeah. CMOS chip or whatever. Yeah, so actually what will happen is, is that, um, so in, 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 in the model that, so we're talking about pre-silicon uh, hardware throwing detection mechanisms. So that's why, so we're looking at this net list. So we are in control ourselves to reliably translate it into, say, uh, the CMOS. So, for example, I've bought an IP core of someone else as a netlist that I like to plug into my larger design of, say, uh, a secure process architecture, say something uh, arbitrary. And I have this hardware accelerator in there that I've bought that is doing uh, AES encryption. But now what I would like to, d to know is whether that hardware accelerator is actually free of throw-ins because I bought it from someone else. But it is in the form of a netlist. So I am in control of the move all the way to the silicon, but I'm not in control of what I got in terms of the netlist from this other entity. So that's where we are. So that's, that allows us some freedom in the detection tool that we have, because if we have the netlist, we can also do some emulation of that IP core. And that's obviously what we'll be using. We're going to look at a first at a learning phase where we are going to um, uh, emulate for a whole bunch of uh, test inputs the behavior of that IP core defined by that netlist. We're going to see whether it fits the functional specification, which we also have. If there's a violation, I immediately know that something bad is happening. If there's no violation, I'm going to collect a set of wire combinations that has been used. And effectively, I'm going to look at a set of wire combinations that has not been used. And what I will be doing, so just to really step forward all the way through uh, this talk, what I'm going to do is that I take this net list uh, that I have, and I'm going to add another tagging circuitry around it, so that if one of the wire combinations that I've never seen will be triggered, then I will raise an exception, and I will actually stop e execution. Now, clearly, uh, you can say, wow, that's kind of dangerous, because if I have my normal behavior, will I not sometimes activate a set of unused wire combinations that I've not seen in my learning phase, and then I will have tagged it, and I will actually flag it, and then I get a false positive, right? Because uh, the AES encryption unit was perfectly fine, but I flagged it down. So that you do not want. So that's why it's very important to reduce the false positives or control it up to a certain rate. And at the same time, of course, you would like to have a strong guarantee on detecting actual hardware throwings if they are present. So that is the big main overview of what I'm talking about here. So I hope that sort of answers. The message that you are using are meaning like testing and program verification. It's a difference that uh, errors all are now adversarial instead of being random. Um, no? So what I will be doing in a learning phase is not so much, it's, it's not like, like we, we don't do formal verification or modeling. That's a very different okay. uh, type of, uh, of, 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 of methodology which we do not like to use because it's actually really hard to, uh, to, to make that <coughs> work. <laughs> so, 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 so nobody has actually really been able to pull that off in an efficient way for heart to detection. 
But um, what we are doing, though, is that we generate ourselves a whole bunch of test inputs, but we have an underlying statistical assumption that, we, that our uh, sampler is actually uh, very close to the real input distribution, right? That, but, but the customer, I hope, will know what his input distribution is for that, for, for, for that, um, um, uh, for, for his, for, for that IP core that, that, that he or she buys. And so uh, that's one of the assumptions, for example. So we are really just taking one input, we run it through the emulator, and we see exactly what happens at every single step. So it's a huge amount of software computation, right? The emulator is just really simulating what's going on. And, uh, and then at the end, you get some output. You test whether it's fitting the functional spec or not. If it does fit it, uh, you, f yeah, you still believe that the IP core is working properly, according to the spec, of course. And at the same time, you're going to keep track of which wire combinations you have been using throughout that computation. You do that thousands and thousands of times for different input patterns. And through that, you're going to look at those wire combinations. You make a list, literally a list, of those wire combinations that you have never used. It's a very simple, uh, many people have been thinking about this, right? So this is a very simple mechanism. It's not, we are not the first doing that. But what we are first at is to create a formal uh, model and a framework in which we can actually prove some hardcore theorems. So that's what we are going to do. Exactly, because that's in control of the uh, customer who bought the netlist and then puts it in his, his own larger design of other kinds of modules that he connects with it. And that will be translated by, by this customer finally into silicon. Yeah, so that... It is actually, uh, um, uh, yeah, maybe I should have put a piece of code in here, but it's, it's a, like a, a lower level code, really. It, it, it talks literally about gates. So you have gates. Uh, you see uh, 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 gate one, gate two, and so forth, yeah, all these gates. You have input wires and output wires. And, and, and it actually describes, if you will, uh, the whole gate layout uh, in uh, a certain language that uh, a compiler can interpret and then map it down actually to the silicon itself. That's sort of how you can think of it. So, so, so you do really have a, a precise description of how the circuitry is going to function in, re in reality. But if you have this very low description, it's extremely hard for you to use formal verification or other kinds of mechanism or reverse engineering to really figure out what was this higher level specification? How can I recognize a hardware throw-in that was implemented in this bunch of uh, uh, lower level code that talks about gates with inputs and outputs? I would need to lay it out almost visually, as, as a human at least, in front of me, and then see maybe pieces of circuitry that look very suspicious, and I need to make some, some, some kind of uh, conclusions out of that. So that's where we are, and the reason why uh, why the manufacturing of that uh, AES encryption core is doing that also. He, he's not going to give us the higher level functional, uh, the, the higher level code that was translated into the netlist. And the reason is that you want to obfuscate any implementation tricks. You want to keep an edge on competition. You don't want to give away how you actually created that very fast hardware accelerator for AES encryption, for example. So that's the model. So it's purely pre-silicon hard to show detection, where we do not uh, uh, worry about uh, the whole trajectory from the netlist onwards to the actual silicon. We only worry about what we got from an untrusted provider. Yeah. Um, so you are working uh, with the user tool, uh, as I saw, uh, as I've seen on the last page, maybe? Um, or we, which kind of tools are you Oh, okay, so um, this is more background. So for the tests, uh, uh, we just use, um, uh, we, we, we create some kind, well, we do different things. Uh, at the end, we have some evaluation uh, section that I will be talking about here. What we have, we have a bunch of uh, uh, benchmarks that, is, that are known in public. So okay. we are taking those uh, in themselves and see how it works with our, I, I with our tools. And, and, and focus on the netlist. Do you use an HL double netlist or 
Yeah. Yeah. No, no, HTL netlist. Oh. And, and then we use um, uh, like a, a model sim emulator, right? Okay. To uh, emulate the, the working of the actual circuitry and see what the wire and values the, would be. The, the, you are currently concentrating on activated frozens, so that, uh, that there are um, only uh, some circumstances, some circuitry is used for some circuitry ah. triggers. Okay, we would we concentrate on all kinds of trojans. Uh, all kinds of trojans, but I will get precisely to the definition of uh, not all kinds of uh, trojans. I will explain exactly what we will not consider, okay. uh, but that will come later. Okay, so we talked about this. So let's go to the problem statement. And oh, we talked about that as well, but let me recap though. So what do we want? We, have a, we want to have an efficient tool, preferably. I'm not going to claim that our tool is going to be truly efficient. I will give the the, the small uh, letters <laughs> later on on the, on the slide where I present this. And we have a negligible, but we do have negligible false negative rate and we do have controlled false positive rate under the right assumptions. So what's the big picture? So and currently, uh, when we look at hard to coverage uh, uh, for pre-silicon detection tools, like current state of the art of air, I trust and fancy, then what is happening is that they are uh, testing their tools against a, a set of Trust Hub benchmarks. Trust Hub is a, is, is a great piece of work actually. It has about 100 uh, uh, known hardware drawings that are listed there, are tabulated. But the question is of course, how effective are Ferret Trust and Fancy outside this tested set of benchmark, benchmarks? There's an unknown characterization of the hardware drawings that they can actually uh, deal with. So that we would like to change. What we would like to do is we would like to create a uh, really precise characterization of a certain set of hardware trojans, exponentially large. And we will show also in this slide deck, if I have time, an, uh, an, an example that really lies outside the scope of Ferret Trust and Fancy. And our tool we want to show actually covers that whole area. So. I will come to this picture later on. I'd like to speed a little bit up, but this is an asymptotic study, just very shortly, that uh, talks about an extended version of Ferret Trust and Fancy that, um, that, that can deal with a, 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 a few more hardware drawings that were later found to defeat these two original tools. And uh, in this is exponential axis, this is an exponential axis, and we show effectively that Hatch will only need to look at unused wires in a path while Ferret Trust and Fancy need to look at unused wires, if you will, in uh, wire combinations in the whole piece of circuitry that we see here. This is not a hardware drawing, it's just a sample circuitry, but the, the, the point that we want to make here is that you get a huge exponential um, uh, complexity or, or double exponential co complexity uh, uh, res as a result of that in these tools, and asymptotically at least we do a lot better. So that is our asymptotic an analysis but we want to look at practical uh, examples. And uh, what we see is that Ferretrust and Fancy have uncontrollable false positives. Uh, actually, you, they are really significantly large. And we can set a parameter that uh, controls that for us. False negatives, unknown characterization, and we're going to define a specific class for which we can then show a negligible false negative rate. So that is the big picture. All right, so we'll go very fast over um, these detection tools that, that we know about in literature. The first one was about unused circuit identification. Again, it's about wires that are not being used. What do you do with those? Maybe you cut them out or whatever you do. But the point is that Ferret Trust uh, extended upon that, did a smarter analysis using some sort of products, products of sums. I'm not, going to, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here but they did a much better job, a much better job on, on this principle. Fancy is looking, by using Boolean function analysis, which, wire, which wires are, uh, which input to output dependencies are, are, are very unlikely. Um, so they try to create some kind of a control value. So it's a really a kind of a heuristic, I would say. And Fancy is then uh, uh, explaining or, or saying, well, if you have a very weak input to output dependency, then maybe you should just uh, flag um, uh, the circuitry if that wire, if that input-output relationship is ever seen. So, 
D-Trash showed that uh, you can defeat those uh, two. So the problem is that these things can always be bypassed by supporting the clones, of course. For every and then uh, the extended Ferret Trust and extended Fancy that they proposed is one where they essentially looked not at single gate level analysis, but they looked at uh, multiple <coughs> stages, uh, so larger pieces of subcircuitry that they were considering. Okay, this is all very fake. Uh, let me make it a bit more uh, explicit when I'm going to talk now about what, uh, about the hardware uh, about the characterization of hardware trojans that I'm going to talk about. So first of all, if you're looking at hardware trojans, we split them up in two kinds. One is they use standard I.O. channels, and those could be uh, the LEDs that we talked about, or the LCD screen. It can be uh, just, uh, you know, all kinds of I input and output uh, uh, channels. But um, they are clearly defined and well documented in your functional specification. The other kinds that you have not documented are, for example, the side channels, like a, 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 a power channel, a timing channel, and so forth. Now, you can always embed a cover channel on top of such a channel, so there's no way you can truly detect uh, uh, with uh, f uh, negligible false negatives any hardware throw in making use of that, so we're not considering this. So within those that use these st standard I.O. channels, we look at those that have a deterministic core and spec, meaning on one hand that the core itself is not going to use, uh, say, a true random number generator or things like that, and the spec as well is, 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 is a pure functional description. So I give you an input, and as a result, this IP core will always produce the same output. There's no variation in it, there's no freedom, because if you have freedom in the output, you can embed again a cover channel. So this, is, this class is what we call uh, the deterministic hardware trojans. So that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about the first parameter that's very important, and we have a sample um, a skeleton here of a very straightforward hardware trojan that takes an input A and B and essentially computes uh, the sum uh, with a carry. So the carry is output here, and here will be A, X, or B. It will be the output over here. I may add a little bit of a hardware trojan circuitry around it, and the result is that if A equals B, then the sum is going to be equal to b rather than a x or b. So only if a equals b, that will happen. So it's a very simplistic uh, trojan. And we can define, first of all, explicit malicious behavior. That is defined as follows. So it refers to behavior where the output is distinguishable from normal output. So take a equals 1 and b equals 1 then the sum will be equal, because of that hardware throwing that is activated, because a is equal to b, will be equal to 1. So it will be equal to 1, which is not equal to 0, which ought to be the output of this sum, because it's a, x, or b that you would want to see over here. So you see that the normal behavior is different from the hardware throwing behavior, and that's what we call explicit malicious behavior. Implicit malicious behavior is one in which you still trigger the hardware throwing, but it turns out that the hardware throwing output happens to be exactly the same as the normal output. So implicit malicious behavior is actually a real problem. And why is that? If we have a learning phase in which we are going to try to understand uh, um, what wire combinations are being used in order to generate normal output, um, well, what are we doing? We're going to check against the functional specification. And the, spe uh, is the, 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 the functional specification in case a equals 0 and b equals 0, tells me that I should see a 0. And that is correct. So I will assume that the functional spec is not yet violated in my learning phase. And as a result, this wire combination is, uh, has been seen. And later on, I will not suspect that if I see uh, a equals b, that something malicious will happen. But it could, right? In explicit malicious behavior or implicit malicious behavior. So the learning phase of any detection tool will greatly suffer from this type of behavior. We excluded side channels completely. Okay. Implicit malicious behavior simply refers to the fact that the output sum for just the green circuitry is exactly the same 
S40 green plus red circuitry, even if the hardware trone, which is the red circuitry, has been activated. So A equals B, which is tested over here, the selection output bit is equal to 1, right? It says yes. Uh, we are going to trigger this hardware trojan and the payload is being delivered, which is this B, which is being forwarded to the sum. Unfortunately, what you really wanted to compute was A, X or B. That should have been the output to that sum. But A, X or B in this particular case is exactly the same as B. So even though the hardware trojan is triggered, the output is exactly the same as what you would expect. So it looks normal. But that's going to be a problem. Ah, um, well, actually, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually quite important. So um, take, for example, our AES encryption uh, uh, module, and suppose uh, we have something like this um, embedded, and say, uh, I will replace, say, uh, the first bit of the ciphertext by the first bit of the key, if the hardware drone is triggered. Well, with probability a half, um, I will actually see no difference in the ciphertext itself because the key bit is exactly the same as the expected output bit. But the adversary knows that it was triggered. So he knows how to interpret the ciphertext and knows that the key bit is actually equal to, say, a zero. So it is important. Um, but the difficulty for hardware thrown detection is, is that this implicit malicious behavior will uh, avoid um, uh, detection in one way because uh, the functional spec does not flag the output because you exactly see what you expect. And at the same time, you see that this piece of circuitry was activated in a certain way and you believe that that's part of normal behavior. So in the future, you will also not flag again this circuitry when it is being activated. And so the hardware throwing can go forward unnoticed. So those are the problems that we're facing here. So this is actually a new a parameter that we, or property that we introduced, implicit malicious behavior, and Fancy and Veritrust, for example, do not talk about this. All right, so um, some other properties. So we're going to talk about the trigger signal dimension, D, and uh, it talks about, in this case, we see a trigger signal that is just the select wire. And so we say that if I just look at the select wire, then that is, I say, a one-dimensional trigger signal that represents this hardware throw-in. I could also have a two-dimensional trigger signal that I could also think of, namely A and B. It could be either A equals 1 and B equals 1, or A equals 0 and B equals 0. So uh, this would be a two-dimensional trigger signal. So what I'm saying here is that uh, we have many possible trigger signals if we look at subsets of wires within the circuitry, but we are interested really in the smallest subset of wires that characterizes uh, the trigger signal for the hardware throw-in. So in this case, the select channel here, the select bit, is just a, a single wire and so the dimension is equal to one for this particular hardware throw-in. Then we are uh, worrying about the propagation delay. So the payload may not be delivered immediately. It may take maybe 100 cycles or 200 cycles or even more. Especially if I have a counter-based hardware throw-in, just for then, then how does that work? It's, say, for example, an always-on hardware throw-in, and it keeps on counting, maybe at a lower clocked, uh, m m m maybe not clocked as fast as the rest of the circuitry. So it counts. At some point, uh, the count is equal to some uh, certain maximum value, and when that happens, you are going to um, uh, deliver the payload. Well, um, just the working of that counter, the incrementing of that counter itself, is also a trigger signal. It's a one-dimensional trigger signal, if you, you, you could think of it like that. But um, if I see some, some flip of the register content, say, going from 2 to 3, I can think of that as being a trigger signal that may have uh, a propagation delay of, say, another 100 cycles before it finally reaches that maximum value that delivers the payload. What I'm going to say here is effectively that you have many different sets of trigger signals that characterize the same hardware throw-in. 
And some of them have a dimension of one, others have a dimension of two. Uh, some of them have a payload propagation delay of, say, 100 cycles, and, other one, and others have a propagation delay of maybe zero cycles. So you have all kinds of combinations. And then we just talked about the implicit behavior factor, which is then the probability that implicit malicious behavior is uh, given, uh, uh, given that the heart sertraline is being triggered. So in our case, we had that 50% of the time on triggering, you will see a violation. And on 50% of the time, you see implicit uh, behavior, meaning that there's no violation of the spec. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define our heart sertraline class. And that heart sertraline class is, uh, uh, so I need, first need to talk about a set T of trigger states that represent the heart sertraline. And we define this as um, follows. Uh, so a set of trigger states represents heart sertraline only if the heart sertraline always needs to pass through one of those trigger states in that set if it is being activated. Now you can have many different sets T that represent a heart vitroleum. And each set will have its own dimension. So we denote it by dt, which is then defined as the maximum, um, maximum uh, number of wires in the trigger state within that set. So you have many different trigger states. For example, a equals b equals 1. That is one trigger state. And a equals b equals 0 is another trigger state. So you will always go through one of the two, so that's why the set containing those two trigger states is actually representing the heart vitroleum. And what's the dimension for this particular set of trigger states? Well, each of those two trigger states contains two wires that it, um, uh, that, uh, that, that it defines, like A equals 0 and B equals 0, or A equals 1 and B equals 1. So. Ah, um, we are not really going to compute this. This is. But this T reflects your test pattern, no? No, I'm not just talking about the hard vitroleans, how they work. And so the test patterns, which are the input patterns to my uh, AES core, uh, that will. Uh, you know, uh, create a, a, a certain, uh, uh, you know, will, uh, uh, over its computation lifetime, it will change from state to state. Sure. And uh, it depends on, 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 on what test pattern you give, uh, what, what input pattern you will give. So, so you will have a deterministic core, that's what you're talking about. So at cycle zero, I just see uh, effectively, um, say, uh, well, if I have a pipeline AES core, then things are a little bit different. But, but say we have um, a state where none of the circuitry is used and only the inputs are being read in. Then the next step, uh, they are going to be used in, say, the first round AES, uh, where you uh, load some S box, et cetera, et cetera, and you do some computations. So that cycle number two is doing a part of that, cycle number three, and so forth. And at some point, say after 100 cycles or what, you have finished uh, the computation and computed the ciphertext's output. Now, along the way, there may be a subset of wires. For example, the wire A and B in our example just now. So let me, uh, let me go back uh, over here. There may be these two wires may have seen an A equals 1 and a B equals 1. So that represents uh, 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 um, activation of the heart vitroleum in this particular setting. And so the AES core goes through all these states. And in one of those states with specific values for each of those wires, that's how I'm thinking about it, there is the wire A and B that are being equal to both equal to 1. And that means that I'm in this particular case and I get activated. So now what we're doing is, is that this trigger set may contain, actually let me use uh, a little bit of this. Uh, so the set T contains, say, uh, A and B equals to 1 comma 1, and a second value A comma B equals to 0 comma 0. 
And uh, why is this a proper set that represents the heart rate throwing? Because if the heart rate throwing gets activated, it will either go through this state or it will go through, or it will go through this state. Uh, another set T, so let's call it T prime, is select bit equals to 1. That was the other wire that we had up here um, on the previous slide uh, over here, where we um, have just um, this particular wire. If that's equal to 1, I'm also triggering the heart rate throwing, right? Then I also will deliver the payload. So this is a proper set of trigger signals as well for the same heart rate throwing. So a heart rate throwing may have many different sets T. And this is, uh, how, uh, uh, this is what we will be using for defining all these different properties, like dimension and stuff like that. And effectively, we are not going to, uh, to discover those sets of trigger signals. We are simply going to prove that no matter what, trigger, what sets of trigger signals with a certain maximum dimension, a certain uh, maximum amount of implicit malicious behavior, a certain maximum amount of latency, that within that set of hardware trojans, our tool hatch, no matter what set of trigger signals we're considering, we are going to do a good job. So that's sort of roughly how we are thinking about this. So, um, okay, so let's uh, move towards this definitional framework some more. So each set, whatever set T you use as set of trigger states, it has its own dimension. It's simply the maximum number of wires within, um, uh, um, within any of the states in a set of trigger states. So here we have two wires. So the dimension of this is two. This is two as well. So the maximum is there for two. So the dimension of this T is equal to two. For this one, we have only one trigger state. It has just describes one wire. So if a dimension equal to one. So now we're going to explain uh, the propagation delay. It's a similar type of definition. In this case, it's simply with respect to this set of trigger states, what is the maximum number of clock cycles that needs to be taken to propagate a malicious behavior after entering a trigger state in T? That's how we define it. So there can be 100 cycles. Uh, for example, um, well, actually, let's go back to the previous example once more. Over here, uh, Suppose I would add some flip-flops uh, in between to sort of really go from clock cycle to clock cycle. Then you could imagine that if A and B have a certain value, that it will have to go through one cycle to another cycle and so forth to deliver the propagation delay. But the select wire is much closer to delivering the payload, so it will actually um, um, have a smaller propagation delay. And then we talk about implicit behavior, and that is now defined as uh, the maximum uh, uh, probability that given uh, uh, the trigger state trick occurs, it will lead to implicit malicious behavior. So we're talking about uh, the alpha here. So now we're finally ready to define this hard to throw in class. It's a set of all these deterministic throwings that we talked about, meaning that the spec is deterministic, the IP core is deterministic, we do not consider side channels. We do not consider random number generators as part of the design. Uh, we uh, do not consider, uh, yeah, so, so, th so that's essentially what we do not consider. And uh, within that type of Trojans, we will be looking at only those that can be represented by, by a set of trigger states with dimensions, say at most D, latency T, and implicit behavior at most alpha. Now, those parameters will will be uh, defining um, um, this set of hardware trojans. And for this class, this large class of hardware trojans, we are going to design our hatch tool. Does it also include, if you like, trigger this person, like, over multiple executions of behavior? Mm -hmm. Like, you can make, like, first one input, and then another input, and another input, and after, like, yeah. 20 inputs. And then uh, the pattern of the inputs, then, uh, okay, so what you're really talking about is whether you keep uh, memory in the state, right? So, because that's what's going on here, right? So, so if a first input together with a second, together with a third input 
jointly are going to activate a heart retrain, right? Then uh, w w what you're talking about is that you would need th that you would have some extra register values that would um, store some state or some joint uh, understanding in order to trigger later on. Yeah, so this is uh, actually okay for uh, pipeline implementations for AES or, 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 or that, that, that's, not, that, that, that's no problem. So what you do is effectively you have a test, what we'll be seeing later on is that we're going to give uh, a series of inputs, a series of plain text, and you continuously get uh, ciphertext out and you do that for one run and you then do it for a second run and a third run. So what does that mean? It means that maybe the propagation delay, if I need, say, 100 plain text to activate this um, uh, final cipher, uh, to, 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 to finally uh, activate the heart-to-throne and deliver the payload, then I would have to see at least uh, 100 cycles of, of history, if you will, right? So in my learning phase, I need to make sure I learn it for long enough. So that translates in the fact that um, I know that uh, there is, uh, if I look at the internal state of the IP core, that there's correlation from that state from one point to the next point, right? Because I have memory. But what I could, uh, uh, what, what we assume in our model is that if I look at the state here and if I wait long enough, then the next state will be more or less in statistically independent from that first state, which is true if I only have a memory of depth, say, 100, then if I look at, say, a, a thousand steps away, then those will be statistically independent. So uh, if I look at our learning algorithm later on, I, I, I go to gory details now, but we have a parameter delta that explicitly models that. So it depends on how deep your memory is, uh, whether you will be able to detect it, and you need to put in the right parameter for that in the, in the tool. But in a like, strict limit, how often you can execute this? Yeah, oh, yeah, you can execute it continuously. Yeah. I mean, uh, but maybe it like, st stops to work after like, 101, and you make this test only until 100, then? Exactly. So, so, so then you have said, in my, in, when I apply hedge for this, uh, for this uh, class, then I can only have that uh, T is at most, say, uh, 99, be because I cannot deal with 101, say, or 102, because um, of the exact argument that you just explained. So this really characterizes exactly what you can protect against, and you cannot protect against anything more. So if you use a, a longer history of memory to activate the heart with Trojan, uh, like a parameter that you've set as input to your learning phase, yeah, then, then, then uh, yeah, you will be outside of the scope. And that is what you can then decide as someone who is running the tool, what complexity class do you want to consider? Clearly you cannot consider everything, you cannot take D to be equal to anything you want and T to be anything you want and so forth, then the complexity of your tool will be too much. We'll come to that in a moment. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so how much time do I have? I mean, you could talk about this for hours, I feel. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we're only, only at slide 18 here. So, uh, so honestly, how much more time do you allow me to have? I think pizza will arrive at 12.15, if that's correct. Uh, okay. So oh my god. <laughs> All right, I'm going to... But we can, yeah, we can, uh, we can eat in this a little bit. Uh, yeah, maybe that would be an idea. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, okay, well, let me try to... Skim through a couple of slides. Yeah, I, c I can also r surprisingly speed up in 10 minutes to do a lot of talking. All of a sudden, uh, you will see the whole picture. But <laughs> it's, it, I think if, I, if you give me, say, 20 minutes, I would be able to get through the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, OK, good. So um, here is another hard set drone that we developed. I will go very quickly through this because uh, it is not really uh, the, the core of, of, of this talk, I feel. And uh, what we did was we created a counter-based uh, heart rate throwing where an LFSR is being um, uh, changing its state. Based on the state that it has, it is being pushed through uh, some circuitry, like uh, some of those are being XORed with legitimate inputs AI, and the whole thing is being XORed together. So the actual circuitry 
is computing an XOR of all the A1, A2 up to AK, while the hard fit throw-in is adding some XOR of register values, uh, like, like, like individual entries within a register. Um, I will quickly go through this. So this re register content, and what do we know? We know that you could uh, design a certain... Um, uh, 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 you, you can look at the first number of registers, and you can find a factor V that is an inner product zero with all of those register contents over here for the first U cycles. And then at the U cycle, uh, it should be equal to one. Oh, so th th that's a mistake. It should be equal to one. And then what you can see, uh, so very quickly, um, what will happen is that the hard set drawing computes not just the sum of all the AJs, that's what you would like to see, but it's also summing up the inner product. It's also adding to this the inner product of that factor V with the register content. This will be always equal to zero, so it will be normal behavior, up to cycle U, and after that, you will XOR a 1 to it and you will change the value here. And that's when you have delivered the payload. And so in this more academic piece of uh, uh, academic kind of hardware throwing, what we will notice is that the dimension D uh, is actually satisfying uh, some kind of a lemma. And uh, what we say here is that this particular throwing um, is in this HDT alpha, where alpha equals zero and with significant <coughs> probability uh, the dimension is at least the log of k minus the um, um, uh, latency uh, minus another thing. So what we prove here is that we can actually design hardware throwings in each of those classes that we just defined. So they are non-empty. All right, let's talk about hash because I really want to explain that. So let's quickly, let's do this. So we have a learning phase here, and I explained it a couple of times. What does it do? It's actually going to emulate from the netlist, the behavior of that IP core with respect to a whole bunch of input patterns. If no malicious behavior is observed in the learning phase, that is, if the functional spec is always satisfied, then everything is okay, and then the tagging phase starts. What's the tagging phase? It will add extra logic, and now we have to explain how much extra logic that's going to be, that for each entry in a blacklist that we generated in the learning phase is going to create uh, in, uh, um, an exception. So effectively, I will see a bunch of wires, a certain wire combination like A equals B equals 1. I certainly see that happening. It's being tagged. And what does that mean? It means that I will run an exception when I, for F, when I see that in the future. So I add extra logic to make that happen. So again, whenever blacklist wires are activated, an exception is raised and uh, the module stops. So what's going on here? Um, uh, this is uh, roughly how uh, this procedure works. Uh, you do this for a number of iterations, but the point is that we have the simulator, which is used to produce the expected outputs given the functional spec. The emulator runs the actual IP core circuitry. Say there are k independent blacklists are created. We do this k times separately. And the final blacklist is going to be the union of these blacklists. I'll explain this in more detail on the next slide, where I try to give intuition. In the end, we'll get a tagging phase that I just explained, where blacklisted wires are tracked. And so you have runtime detection. The complexity looks pretty OK with respect to the parameter that defines the false negative rate. It's pretty OK with respect to the implicit malicious behavior. The reason is that impl implicit malicious behavior should not be like 99% because that truly means that the adversary gets very little uh, out of the hard fit um, So generally you would expect alpha to be uh, really less than one, not asymptotically close to one. So this should be okay. We have this is defining, this delta is about the statistical assumption that we just talked about. The rho is about the false uh, positives that we want to set. N is the number of wires, uh, well, in the whole IP core, uh, because uh, we want to uh, track everything that happens in there. And then raised to the power D, the dimension. So now you can see the complexity is awful when it comes to this parameter D, right? If D is really large, you're toast with this detection tool. But still, asymptotically, we're doing much better 
um, than any of the other hardware showings, orders of magnitude. So how do you create the uh, Right, so, uh, okay. yeah, so, so, so let me go to the next uh, slide, and I hope to actually we skip that one, and then I can explain that. So what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to test a bunch of inputs. For each input, I'm going to um, uh, look at what states I've been going through in my IP core during my em emulation. And I look at every uh, D wire combinations and I'll just make a list. I see, well, I see these D wires, so I have N choose D wires, that's a lot, right? Uh, for all of those combinations, for all of those possibilities, I'm going to list whether I see which of the two to the power D combinations I have seen. And so the blacklist will be the complement of what I've seen. And um, I'll keep on reducing the blacklist when I test more and more inputs. Because if I just test one input, I've almost seen no combination. But if, I, if I've tested like 100,000 inputs, I've started to really reduce this quite a lot. Um, notice uh, a little catch here is that even in normal behavior, say take an AND gate, yeah, uh, I will never see uh, a, a, a one and a one input producing a zero output. So you always see certain combinations that even under normal circumstances never occur. So you have to be, if you want to make an efficient tool, you should make sure that you do some optimizations to, 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 to deal with that. And that's what we did, actually. But in any case, the blacklist reduces quite a lot. At some point, it stays flat. And if it stays flat for long enough, you stop. You do this a first time, a second time, and a case time. And now you take the union of all those blacklists. So let's look at the false negative rate. Suppose um, a hardware throne is actually present in the uh, IP core, and this hardware throne um, is not being detected. So what does that mean? It's not part of B, the, the, the union of all those blacklists. That means that there was a trigger state that was seen during this learning phase and during this learning phase and during this learning phase and, this, and, 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 and these trigger states were seen but were not taken in, but, but they did not lead to a reduction of the blacklist. So the only way that that could have happened is if implicit malicious behavior occurred. So. What's the probability that that happened over here? It's at most alpha, happened over here at most alpha, and so on. If you, you can take the product if you believe in statistical independence assumptions, right? And then um, if we set k large enough for that particular alpha, we can get it down to 2 to the power minus lambda. The false positive rate turns out to be equal to rho. Why yeah? should this rate be independent? Um, well, because, say, take again your AES module. It's actually a pretty reasonable assumption. Um, so take your AES module. What? Well, it depends on the input um, um, uh, distribution, uh, uh, right? So if we are looking at uh, a bunch of inputs here, they are, say, randomly selected among all possible plain texts. And uh, when we're talking about a trigger state that is being uh, activated and then leading to implicit malicious behavior, so nothing happens. So, uh, that, so, so that's the definition of how we talk. So that's a hardware throwing property. Then uh, uh, since, since these inputs are completely at random selected from that input distribution, independently from how these inputs are selected from that same input distribution and so forth. So that's the independence that we have here, and that leads to that product. But, uh, but it's a hard drawing property that you see an alpha here and the alpha here and the alpha there, right? So that's, that's a property of the hard drawing itself. Um, Sorry? So this, uh, uh, this how? It, oh no, uh, alpha is a fixed parameter, 
so that's the implicit behavior that is fitting that hardware trillion. And that uh, can range for the trusted benchmarks, as you will see, from 0 0.9 to 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 or whatever. Well, but it's defined in a certain way, no? It's got the, mm -hmm. got some probability, no? And what is the probability space of this probability? So, the probabi so, so alpha is simply defined as the probability over, uh, okay, as the probability that implicit b behavior is yeah. seen given a triggering of the hardware trojan on a specific test input where the probability is taken over all these inputs that are taken from the sampler that I use in my learning phase. Now, I need a couple of assumptions here that the sampler is pretty accurate to what I actually will be uh, using later on uh, and, 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 and so forth. So now, That is correct. So um, that's right. So suppose I have a trapdoor, right? Take the trapdoor for a hardware trillion. Yeah, that's very unlikely to be uh, tested here. So, but that means that the hardware trillion was never really activated in any of those uh, any of those times. So say the select bit will be part of this black uh, will actually be part of, of of these blacklists, and so I will be happy. Uh, so so things will be okay. So that is sort of how, how we're looking at it. Um, so um, yeah, so the so, so, so that so the select wire is, is blacklisted here and here and here. So also blacklisted in the union, of course. And so I will later on be able to detect it during online detection through my tagging circuitry. Now the false positive rate, unfortunately, that costed uh, 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 two double column pages IEEE format to prove it. But um, we did did a rigorous job. And I've quickly put down a bunch of the, the statistical assumptions that we're talking about. And I quickly, because you guys are actually really interested in all the details, which is great. So I'll take the opportunity to, 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 to explain it a little bit. So the first, prob the first assumption is that with probability at least a half, testing another range of delta divided by row inputs would not reduce uh, any of the K blacklists. That's, uh, uh, that's roughly a translation of a uh, precise formula. So in other words, this, what you see here is actually a significant uh, event, statistical event. Mm. Secondly, the states corresponding to the same test input that are separated by delta cycles, that was the discussion that we had before, are statistically independent. So delta should be large enough. It should effectively, um, it's with respect to the memory that the system has. Um, the state distribution is statistically independent of the cycle number at which the state occurs, meaning that um, if I'm going to look uh, at, say, uh, the state in my pipeline AS circuitry at, at cycle 50, uh, that distribution looks pretty much the same as uh, at cycle 100. It doesn't really matter. Um, now, what is true, though, is that the joint distribution of serval states over serval cycles can be completely correlated. It can be the case that the state at cycle 50 is exactly the same as the state at cycle 100. But if I just look at the distribution of si uh, at cycle 50, that distribution is, ex is exactly the same as the distribution at cycle 100. Anyway, the learning phase um, is also sampling the real input distribution closely. All right, so uh, now we'll quickly go to the evaluation. Uh, so we've talked about this more than enough. Hedge is doing a great job. So then the evaluation <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, uh, um, uh, so what did he do? We first of all, of course, also looked at all the benchmarks, right? Everybody's doing that, we do that too. So besides our theoretical contributions and proofs, uh, we can show that we can do all the benchmarks uh, and we can also do the new hardware challenge that were presented by Dietrich that defeated those detection tools and also our own hardware trillion. Um, so quickly, for Trust Hub, uh, we have a bunch of deterministic hardware trojans and non-deterministic hardware trojans with standard, uh, standard I.O. channels or ones that use side channels. So we don't consider those. We don't consider those. We only consider those. It turns out all of those have a dimension equal to 1. So our message is 
we don't have, uh, we, we have absolutely, uh, we have not been able to detect any of the advanced hardware showings ever, uh, in, at least not in public, uh, with respect to, uh, which, I mean, it's so easy to design something more complex, as we now understand from this framework, that, 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 that is much more complex than this, that, that this really, uh, we are really worried that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I taught an MCU ap uh, a microcontroller uh, application uh, course, um, uh, my students have to order like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, these uh, MCUs, and uh, one of them was not working very. Uh, some somehow the um, um, uh, EEPROM was not working. It was fried or something like that. So I said, "Can I have that uh, piece?" Because I have some colleagues uh, um, at that time who were able to figure out whether, this may, whether they may be counterfeit. And it was. It turned out to be a counterfeit uh, product. So, um, so in my class, one out of uh, 20 <laughs> legitimately bought a <laughs> MCU controller yeah, through the supply chain from, at, from uh, an Atmega processor, was actually uh, di di was a, a counterfeit. So, we're really talking about a huge amount of hardware that we can absolutely not, not trust. And this study, I hope, will show to everybody that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We need a real framework, and that's what I present here, about which we can reason about exponentially large classes. And then we can also understand how we can defe defeat Hatch. We want to make D very large. And, uh, and that's an open question. How large can we get D without um, having other mechanisms available to us. So maybe I need a huge footprint in my, uh, as, 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 as a hardware throwing in order to get D very large and so forth. So maybe then I have other mechanisms to detect such throwings. So that's an open question. So we did experimental results, a bunch of those throwings. We saw that the blacklist was reduced quite dramatically. Um, uh, for pipelines, it's about twice the number of area overhead and non-pipeline because you need to add uh, flip-flops in the middle, right? That um, remember where you are. So, but it is still, yeah, it ranges from 15% to uh, 4%. 4% or 15% is prohibitive by industry, by the way. Nobody likes that. But still, from academic perspective, that is pretty cool that we can start out with this much. This is a little bit better. And now we have the conclusion, which says that uh, we have introduced this characterization of, uh, of advanced hardware, pro hardware drawing properties and provided a nice classification of those, of, 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 of those hardware drawing classes. We show that the benchmark hardware drawings are only in the simplest class that we have defined and just reflect tip of the iceberg. Hatch is a powerful hardware detection tool. Uh, it does detect benchmark trigger-based um, deterministic hardware throwings. It detects exponentially large hardware throwing class with negligible probability, blah, blah, blah. It offers a sub exponential computational complexity as opposed to exponential complexity of existing schemes when we look at asymptotics. But sub exponential is still obviously not acceptable in, in practice, right? But, uh, and we think the area overhead is pretty low, but in practice, of course. Even if you have 10%, uh, you mo may blow up the area a lot, right? It's a lot more costly that way. But anyway, that's where we are with the research. So thank you so much. And if you want to know more about this, we do have two e-prints uh, submitted as journal papers now. And uh, you can look for more description over here. Uh, and then you can see the links to those two as well. So thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How does the tagging work? Oh my God, did I not explain that? So um, the tagging works like this. Um, so I generate a blacklist, and a blacklist mm. looks like, um, uh, for example, like uh, 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 a comma b equals one comma one because I did not see this triggered, and maybe a comma b equals zero comma zero. I see another one, which is to select one, which is maybe comma another wire say x which is equal to uh, one comma 
zero and another one which is select with another y which is maybe 1,1 1, 1, and so forth. So I have, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a whole bunch of uh, two out of n wire combinations and um, uh, what do I do? I have a blacklist and, and now I'm looking at my circuitry. I see these wires, uh, so simplistically we have the A and the B. There will be a tacking circuitry above that takes these two together and tests for 1-1. One, one. If that is true, then an exception should be raised. Uh, so if this is equal to 1, 1, or if this is equal to uh, 0, 0, uh, then it should also raise an exception, or if this occurs or that occurs. So I create a whole tacking circuitry that takes as input internal wires, wire values, and then uh, creates an end tree on top of that, like, like you, you first test whether a, certain thing, whether a certain condition is satisfied. So um, that is being tested over here, and now you have a whole tree on top of that, which is just an end tree, and in the end, uh, sorry, um, uh, not an end tree, but an uh, OR tree, uh, that will then in the end raise an exception. So it's just uh, an extra piece of netlist that you add to the existing netlist. And it, it's only 2% larger than the original circuit? Uh, well, it was ranging. It was uh, this, this overhead was 15% uh, for some. 4% for others, we even saw one I think with 0 to 2% or 2%. So it really depends. But we did that only for the trust hub benchmarks, right? So we have to be very careful here. Uh, so maybe this, over this area overhead is really fluctuating quite a lot, to be honest. So um, I, I can totally see that it does not work for large IP cores to begin with. And secondly, uh, it really depends on the exact type of IP core functionality and so forth and implementation, the, the size of it, whether it would work. Yeah. And, and what do you do with exceptions? I mean, then the chip yeah, so the then you will, like yeah, then you will say uh, uh, stop. So say it's part of your secure processor architecture, then you will get a so flag. I mean, like for example, the denial of service token would, I mean, that would be what a denial of service uh, token wants to do, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so then you have translated into denial of service, but uh, the idea is that, uh <coughs> um, um, yeah, so that's exactly right. So if you have a hardware throw-in um, that you did not detect, so, so let's think about the landscape, right? So we have hatch, and now we have applied hatch, and this will detect everything, say, in H, D equals 2, and T equals this, and whatever. If there's a hardware throw-in that is in HD equals 3, I did not detect it, and that will not even be uh, detected at all. Um, the point is that those hardware throw-ins are the only ones that will, be, uh, that, 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 that will get an exception raised. And uh, if my goal is to do a denial of service, uh, then, uh, yeah, you're right, I can just plug in um, uh, such a type of throw-in uh, and my tacking circuitry, if it's not detected during the learning phase, we'll then uh, see what's happening. But it depends on how, what the functional spec is going to be all about. Uh, what do you put in your functional spec with respect to denial of or throughput? It's such a difficult uh, measurement. So, so maybe, because that leads to cover channels. So, yeah, so in our case, we want to be very precise about what we can deal with. And, and so um, uh, um, changing the amount of time before something arrives uh, should actually be detected. Your functional spec should say, I get my ciphertext exactly after, say, 100 cycles, not 102 cycles, 107 cycles. I, I need to get it that particular moment. Yeah. Right, thanks for the nice discussion. Martin, again, thanks for the talk, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you Let's so thank much. Thank you, Peter, again. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot.